Okay, why don't we uh, go ahead and get started? So, welcome back everybody to uh, EE240. Uh, so, hopefully, some more people will be trickling in here, but uh, handing back the uh, midterm, so they're just over there. Uh, if you don't end up showing up here in person, then you should come by my office to pick them up. Uh, the only quote unquote bad news is it's spring break next week, and I'm going to be out basically this afternoon on. Uh, I'll be back sort of over spring break, so if you're not here and you didn't pick up your exam, then just send me a note and we can schedule time for you to come grab that. Uh, other than that, we've kind of got a lot of uh, stuff to go through th today, so I'll just maybe dive right in. Uh, obviously, in terms of the midterm itself, you're probably wondering, you know, how you did. So the mean was 25, and the standard deviation was about 7.5 or so. Um, it was actually somewhat of a uniform distribution, but I guess we have a small sample size, so that's not too particularly surprising, I suppose. Uh, obviously, you know, if you take a look and you feel like you were misgraded for some reason, we try to do a fairly you know, good job of keeping that consistent. Uh, but we're human too, so it's possible some mistakes are made. Uh, so as usual, if, if, something, if you think something went wrong, just bring, you know, write it up, bring back your exam to me. I'll take a look at it. Uh, the only caveat, of course, is I'll take a look at the entire exam, not just sort of what you're pointing me to. Uh, so I may find things in either which direction. But you know, again, if you think something didn't exactly go correctly, feel free to come and bug me about it. Uh, just one other sort of quick uh, administrative kind of thing. Uh, the CAD tools may be down from about Sunday night until Tuesday morning. Uh, that's just because basically they're going to be shutting down the power in Quarry Hall uh, on, all day on Monday. So I think this is in some sort of preparation for that. Uh, so just sort of a little bit of a warning. You know, if, if, that's, if you're sort of trying to do the homework and it's Monday or Sunday night or whatever, things aren't working, that's probably why. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think there's a whole lot I can do about that. But you know, that sort of forewarned you, and hopefully you guys will be starting on the homework well enough ahead of time that this won't be sort of a significant impact on you. Uh, and in fact, there's even sort of a couple problems there. So you can always do the sort of analytical problem before or during the time that everything is down. So just a couple other sort of things I wanted to go over in terms of the midterm itself. Uh, really mostly just sort of either common mistakes I saw or you know, errors that we ourselves made. So the first thing was just on problem number one. Uh, if you guys remember, it looked sort of something like that. So just about everybody remembered to sort of add a noise source from the transistor. But for some reason, a lot of people forgot that resistors actually generate noise too. Uh, so kind of the high level comment there was just remember, you know, always include all of the noise sources in the circuit unless I explicitly say otherwise, which sometimes I do. But, you know, don't forget that other stuff is there. You know, it maybe wouldn't have changed the answer in a huge way, but, you know, just keep in mind all all resistors, all transistors, all those things, all generate noise, OK? Uh, the other thing was, this was actually an error in the solution itself. Uh, there was a substitution there that was done that was wrong. The final gain is actually this. So it's just minus GM3 times RL. Uh, most people actually, well, I guess people who sort of went through that problem kind of usually got that final, right, final answer right. Um, but a lot of people actually seem to get sort of a little bit confused on the noise side. So for those of you guys who didn't sort of take a look at the solutions, it turned out that for way, the way I had set that circuit up, and just as a reminder, the circuit looked something like basically this. There was just a bias current there, and the input signal was coming from here. OK, so it turned out that if you really did do things right, and you kept track of the signs correctly, in other words, you actually figured out the transfer function for that current noise on the input device to the output. There was, I did not actually get something wrong. That really was zero noise at the output. Okay. Now, by the way, this is called a sort of so-called noise cancellation circuit. But don't worry, I'm not breaking any thermodynamics. Okay, Because even though the noise from this device maybe is zero at the output, there's still going to be some noise at the output. right? Because I'm still going to have noise from this device. I'm still going to have noise from that device. So nothing there was being broken from a sort of thermodynamic standpoint. It was just that I'm be basically able to now trade off between what's the resistance I present at that input versus how much noise contribution I'm going to get at that output over there. Okay. So if you're interested, again, this is called a noise cancellation circuit. I'm actually not a huge fan of that name just because it's not really that you don't have any noise anymore. It's just you don't have noise from that input device. Okay. Uh, the last thing, which is actually kind of an important one, which is why I did it in red and underlined it here, uh, on the final problem, actually really the final part of the final problem, 
Uh, a lot of you guys actually got an answer that was slightly even more accurate than what I had in the solutions. Um, but unfortunately, a lot of times the way you got there was conceptually not exactly correct. So just, you know, and most of them sort of came down to one really important thing. So a lot of you guys, when you looked at that problem, said, okay, well, V star is just, is basically set by 2ID over GM, right? Well, and then you tried to use that and say, okay, well, if that's V star, then if I calculate the delta V and plug that in for sort of V star, then, you know, I'll somehow get the change in current at the output. Well, remember, VGS minus VTH is by no means equal to V star, okay? V star is just something that we defined in order to basically handle the issues with the devices not being long channel devices, okay? So anytime you see a circuit problem and you're tempted to treat V star as being a small signal VGS minus VT, don't do it, okay? That's not actually correct. Again, V star is really just, it's, it's a parameter that relates GM and ID and not anything else, okay? So although we talk a lot about how V star is similar to VGS minus VT, those two are not the same thing, okay? You guys kind of get what I'm referring to here or because I see a few somewhat confused looks. So, you know, raise your hand or something if you have a question. Okay, so again, just, you know, one final reminder because it was something that was happening fairly often in the exam. V star is not VGS minus VT. Okay, so you know, if you remember nothing else from today, remember that. Okay, any other kind of questions on the midterm or, or the, the questions that were there? So you guys would all ace it now, right? Okay, well, I'll take that as a no. Uh, you know, again, make sure you actually go through the exam, go through the solutions. The, the whole reason I hand out the solutions is to make sure you guys kind of understand the material that's there because the assumption is that moving on forward, you understand kind of all of the stuff that we've gone to on that point. Okay, so just one other sort of last quick thing that I wanted to briefly mention. As I talked about last time, you know, this homework number four is really kind of like a miniature design project. So essentially, I'm going to give you a set of specifications, and it's your job to go and build an amplifier that meets that set of specifications. Now, just as a reminder, in general, you know, when you're doing analog design, it's not that you should just be implementing specs, but this is really kind of a good intermediate step for you to make sure you understand all the material and kind of how to apply it to a design problem. So the quote-unquote fun part here is that you can build any amplifier you want, and you can kind of make it work any which way you want. Uh, but obviously, some things will be sort of easier to work with than others. And particularly by the end of lecture today, we should go through sort of an example of what type of design methodology you could use to really do that. But there's one just kind of quick thing that I wanted to mention because it's a fairly common issue that, that comes up. So let's just say that I'm going to use a very simple sort of single-ended common source amplifier and tie it into sort of capacitive feedback like this. So I have some CS, some CF. That's my VIN, right? So now clearly when I build this thing, I need to somehow define the bias on the input of my transistor there, right? Somehow I need to just set that current, basically set that voltage to some nominal spot, okay? So for this problem, I said, okay, I'm going to give you like one ideal current source or voltage source or something like that. So you can use it to actually create the bias. So how do you think you'd actually create the bias for something like this? Again, just in spice, like in a, as a simple trick that you would use. What do you guys think? Current mirror with the big inductor. Okay, there we go. So that's one way of doing it. So you might do something like a current mirror over here. And then what Dan, Dan said was, okay, maybe I even put a big inductor right there. So that actually works. And, you know, just to make sure it's clear why you said to do an inductor, most of the time what people will say is something like, well, okay, I'll put a big resistor there. Kind of similar idea, but that's oftentimes what people will do. So now, why is it that you know, is there any problem you might run into if you actually used a resistor there? Particularly from the standpoint of your simulation? Yeah, it's noise. Noise? Yeah, so if I used a resistor, it's actually going to add in some noise, right? And if you pay attention, I gave you a reasonably aggressive noise spec. So it'd be kind of annoying if you were getting noise just from this stupid resistor that you used here, right? 
Now, of course, in reality, there's going to be all kinds of other switches and things like that in your actual circuit that would have added noise in any case. But clearly, you don't want to be sort of, you know, at least for this design problem, you don't want to be sort of shooting yourself in the foot for no good reason, right? So there's kind of one of a couple of ways you can solve that. So one is when you type this thing into Spice, rather than calling it, let's say, R1, let's call this V1 and V2, V1, V2, let's say 1, you know, 1 mega ohm or something like that. Instead of using an R, you can instead actually use a G element. So a G element is a transconductance, just like you know, GM we use in our small signal models. The nice thing about using a G element is that it, because it's a controlled source, Spice assumes that that's somehow you know, some fake model that you're using. And so it doesn't add any noise at all from that G element. Okay? So if you're doing a biasing like that, then don't use real resistors. Use a G element, okay? Because then it'll not have any noise with it. The other option that, as Dan mentioned, was you could also perhaps use a big inductor instead. Now, you just have to be a little bit careful with a big inductor because that will indeed cause a resonance peak at some frequency. And so if you're not careful with where you sort of put that, you might see really weird results in your simulation. So you might see something like, you know, you plot the small signal gain, and it does, you know, something like, let's say, that. Right? Where, and in fact, this may be large enough that you can't even see the scale of everything else, especially if you use like a really huge inductor on the side over there. Okay? But either one of those things basically works fine. Just be careful, you know, you don't want to basically mess yourself up in terms of noise just from the biasing network. Any kind of questions on this? Or? By the way, has anybody actually started homework number four? Okay, one brave soul, huh? So definitely get going on that. Again, you know, spring break is next week, so there's actually not a whole lot of time after that. And this really is kind of a miniature project. So you want to get started early on it because, you know, anytime you're doing design, things don't quite work exactly the way you wanted to the first time. And so it just takes time to actually iterate and really understand what the issues are. So again, you know, make sure you get going on that. You know, I know we just did the midterm and all, but get going on that. Getting the design project out of the way will put you up in very, very good shape for the project, which, by the way, is also coming up in about a week and a half, two weeks or so. Okay? All right. So any other kind of questions on either midterm or homework or anything like that? Okay. So with that, let's actually go back into the material we were talking about. So last time we were basically talking about settling. And we basically had covered all the stuff we need to know about linear settling. So we essentially finished up with talking about you know, what happens when you have a single pole, what happens when you have a feed forward zero, what happens when you actually have the non-dominant pole, what happens when you have pole zero doublets. And so now finally we kind of came to the point where we said that Okay, you know, those linear models are nice and great. But of course, if you build a real, let's say, a differential amplifier, it's going to look something like this. And of course, if you big put in too large of a differential input, the amount of current you get is going to be clipped because of that bias, right? And so what we said was that if we sort of plotted the differential output current versus the differential input voltage, we were going to get something, at least approximately, to make our life easy, that looked like this. Again, of course, the real curve doesn't look like that, but you know, we were going to approximate it this way. And again, just as a reminder, we said that the point at which you basically clip in current is at, a v, at v star. And of course, the maximum current you get is IB. Okay? So this is the model I'm going to be using kind of for the rest of these slides to sort of derive what the impact of that slewing is. But there's one quick thing that I just want to mention, particularly because it's likely to come up in your design project that you're going to be doing over the next you know, week and a half or so. So I drew this curve here for a differential amplifier. But let's say I had an amplifier that now looked like this. Okay? And let's, let's still assume that Vn is sort of around some nominal bias point. So what would the curve for that amplifier look like, roughly speaking? What do you guys think? Does it still look exactly like this red curve? Or? Can't go negative, right? 
Well, okay, I mean, so let's, let's assume that somehow this point right here is relative to the nominal bias. So, like, this is really delta Vn. And, of course, my I out is also relative to the nominal bias, meaning that if I, if I put Vn right at the nominal, I have no current flowing into V out because the IB just flows directly into the transconductor. Okay? So now let's let's maybe do it, let's maybe just think about it intuitively. So if I put a really negative Vn in, in other words, Vn goes really low, how much current's gonna be flowing into the output? What do you guys think? IB? Yeah, IB, right? So that kind of looks similar, right? If I put too low of a voltage in, at some point I'm just always gonna get IB flowing out, right? Okay, and of course, just as a reminder, this is a negative V star roughly. Okay, so that's probably pretty similar. So now as I start going over here, probably things are about the same. Okay, and probably at least initially over here, things are about the same too. But now, what's going to happen if I put in a really big V in, a really big positive V in? What's going to happen then? What do you guys think? Just keep drawing current. Yeah, it's just going to keep drawing more current, right? So now, you know, if life was really good, it would have been linear like that. Of course, it's not really going to do that. It's going to kind of curve up and then eventually it'll flatten out because you sort of saturate the device. But basically, the point is, you know, this point right here has nothing to do with V star anymore, right? So again, the only reason I mention this is because, particularly in your design project, since you might end up doing a single ended amplifier, be careful that you actually check the worst case slewing. Because putting a step up may not give you the same slewing behavior as putting a step down, right? Because a step up, it may just, transistor may just be perfectly happy to give you more current. Step down, you may be limited by the bias current in the other side of the amplifier, okay? Does this make sense to everybody here? So again, just sort of a warning on your project, because this was a fairly common thing that we saw people doing in the past, so I just want to make sure people get it right here. Okay. So, but going back to our sort of original model, in other words, that red curve, which is from the differential amplifier, or in fact, even for the single-ended one, as long as we're on this side, what I basically want to do now is figure out what is going to be sort of how can we treat that slewing and kind of come up with an analytical model for how that's going to change our settling time, okay? And again, I don't want to be doing a bunch of integrals and stuff like that, because clearly, if I'm integrating a bunch of nonlinear differential equations, yeah, I'm just going to be sitting there doing that for the rest of the semester, and you won't be learning anything particularly interesting, okay? So the way I'm basically going to handle this is I'm going to say that initially, it's just going to slew with some constant current set by that IB, and then once it gets into the quote-unquote good region, it just settles linearly with sort of our standard exponential behavior. So what I'm basically saying now is that I'm going to split the settling time into two pieces, the slewing portion and the linear settling portion. Okay? So let's take a look at actually sort of where that would come from and what sort of the model would be in these different regimes. Okay? So again, just to be clear, what I'm really talking about here is the small signal model I've drawn in the slide is just corresponding to this situation, okay? Where again, I've just replaced that OTA with its GM over here. But now, what I've done is, since I've placed an input step over here, remember there's always some feed forward, right? So in other words, there's actually an input step that appears right there at the input of the OTA which again, of course, is that node right there, right? So now what I'm doing is that I'm assuming if that input step was large enough that actually the amplifier starts to slew, in other words, that that input step at this point right there is larger than V star, then now rather than, I, than having actually a GM out of my amplifier, I'm just going to get some fixed ISS, right? It's just going to be some fixed current. Now, by the way, you know, when you really do this, in your actual circuit, if you're not careful, you might not really get that full bias current. 
something might come out of saturation or something like that. So you should also always check that that's really what you get. But for now, let's assume that indeed I do get the full ISS or the I bias of current that's in my OTA. Okay, so if this is what I have in terms of sort of the model of my OTA during the slewing, then if I was to look at the time domain waveform at the output, so just V out versus time, what's that going to look like? And let's just say it started from some point right here. What is that going to look like? Straight line. Yeah, it's just going to be a straight line, right? It's just going to be a straight ramp like this. What's the slope of that ramp going to be? And I don't need like a precise answer. Just, you know, what's the form of, of that line there? Or what's the slope of that line? Anybody remember, you know, the really basic thing about capacitors and how it's related to currents and stuff like that? ISS, ISS over C. There we go. Okay, so this is just ISS over C, right? Because, of course, I equals C delta V delta T, right? So if we want delta V over delta T, then it's just I over C. And in fact, if you kind of remember from maybe one of your digital classes, if you even wanted to calculate the delay, it would just be C delta V over I. Right? So in fact, we're going to use that in one second. Because if we know that we have this ISS of current flowing through here, we know we're going to have this linear ramp coming out of the output there. And so then really all we have to do is calculate how long am I going to be in the region where I have that linear ramp until basically I get back into a quote unquote good condition. Where the, by what I, when I say good, what I mean by that is just go back into the region where this amplifier is linear. So we're actually going to show this on some plots in one second, but maybe you guys should tell me. So let's say that you know, this starts out of some initial step height. Let's not worry what that is for one second. At what point in voltage, actually so to be specific, at what point in voltage right here on that internal node, when, when do I, what voltage do I have to hit in order to start having linear settling again? What is that voltage? Star. Yeah, it's V star, right? Just because, again, <laughs> that's, that's kind of my model. And I, hope, you know, I think last time we even covered a little bit why is it really V star where you sort of transition between being clipped and having the linear thing. So really what we're going to be looking for here is we know that initially it's going to have this linear ramp. Then once this point hits V star, then we're going to start having some more linear behavior. So in fact, that's kind of what these plots here are showing us. So if we just look, and by the way, these are just to label it. Again, the actual input of the OTA is Vx. Okay, This is V in, and of course, that's V out. Okay. So again, if I just put a step at this very input over here, at that point right there, because of the feed forward, I'm initially going to get a step. Okay, and for now, let's assume that that step is larger than V star. Well, when I get that step over here, I'm also actually going to get a step at the output, right? Then what's going to happen is that OTA starts responding to that step. All right, so if I put a positive step right here, then of course I'll start drawing negative current out of it. And so I start slowing down with a linear ramp, just like we just said. Then once I hit this V star, now I get back into the sort of region that we're used to. So I start doing essentially some exponential settling like this. Okay, that's not the best exponential in the world, but maybe you guys are more talented artists than I am. Okay? And of course, similarly, if I look at the output, also once I start the linear settling, then I have an exponential, maybe I'll draw it a little bit better, I have the exponential settling at the output as well. Okay? So as we had just said, this slope right here is just CSS, oops, is just ISS over whatever the effective load capacitance is, okay? So if I was actually to write sort of an equation versus time, then I would just say that that V out is something like it's proportional to ISS over CL times T, right? 
And of course, there's a negative sign here just because I'm starting from somewhere and ramping down, right? OK, so now just a couple of sort of questions here. So one first one, if I look at this exponential settling over there, where should this end up? Where should the final value of sort of this thing be? What should it be approaching? And this is vx again, by the way. Yeah, it should be approaching 0, right? Because I have this whole thing in feedback. That's the virtual ground. It's supposed to be going towards 0. Where is this supposed to be settling towards? What's well, kind of like the final value there? And I, again, I don't need the number, but just conceptually. The C of times V in. Yeah, exactly. So I, this should converge to whatever the closed loop gain is, which in this case is, of course, CS over CF times V in. And just to be really clear, there's a minus sign there. Right? So that's kind of the final value there. OK, so that's, that's all good. And I'm just pointing these things out, because they're going to be useful to us for in one second to kind of figure out how I can even write an equation for what this slewing time is and what, for what this linear settling time is. OK, now just one other sort of important thing, which is related to my lack of talent as an artist, but you know, it's a useful thing to actually question you guys about. So if I was to look at, if I was to compare this slope right here with the slope of the curve during the exponential settling, OK? So if I was to plot, let's say, the derivative of this wave of this part of the waveform versus the derivative of that part of the waveform. Where should you be seeing the highest slope? Which part of the waveform should have the highest slope? Is it during the settling, excuse me, during the slewing part? Or is it during the linear part? Slewing? Yeah, it better be during the slewing, right? Why is that? Uh, because that point is actually intersection of the normal exponential curve and the linear curve. Uh, I guess everything you're saying is correct, but you know, physically, I guess, why is it that this part should have the highest your ramp rate? Less current. Yeah, OK, the there we go. Right. So remember, the whole point is that during this region, the OTA is providing the maximum current it can possibly provide. Right. So if you ever had a drawing, which again is related to my lack of talent as an artist, but you know, in this drawing right here where it kind of looks like the exponential is sharper than the linear part, Obviously bogus, right? This thing had better be at most the same slope as that, because otherwise something is wrong. Okay. So just be careful, you know, even for yourself when you draw it, or you know, when you when you kind of think about it intuitively. Remember, this is always the region of the maximum slope. And if you're not careful with like factors of two and things like that, you might get confused and think that this is even faster. It's definitely not. It has to be slower than what happens during the slewing. Okay. So if you kind of understand this, then actually I claim that we have everything we need to know in order to go back and actually recalculate what the overall settling time will be. So let's see how we can do that. So again, what I'm going to do is I'm breaking this into the two periods, the slewing period and the linear settling period. And so first what I'm going to do is just calculate how long do you stay in that slewing region. So to do that, first we just need to sort of calculate a couple of things. So one is we need to know how big was this step right here. In other words, right at the beginning of time, how big of a voltage did you actually put into that OTA? Okay. Well, that's pretty straightforward. It's just basically set by the capacitive divider, right? And so that's really kind of what all of this stuff here is saying. So it's just the the step at that input of Vx is just the input step times this capacitive divide, where this C2 is just basically C1 versus the, it's really the series combination of CF and CL. Okay? So that's the size of the input step. Okay, so now once I know that, then I sort of just need to know a couple of things, right? So remember we said that I'm going to get out of the slewing region right when Vx hits V star, right? So what I need to know is really how much change in voltage is that? In other words, from this Vx step, which is the initial voltage, to get to V star, how much delta V do I need to go? Right? What's the range in delta V I need to cover? That's important because even though it's really this voltage here that's going to be V star, 
Remember, where I'm drawing the current from is all the way there at the output. But if I know the swing in voltage at Vx, I also know the swing in voltage at the output, right? Because for a certain change in Vx, there should be a certain change in voltage at the output, just because of the capacitive divider, right? And we just have to, be, have to be careful about one thing here. And maybe I'll go back to the picture. So if I say that there's one millivolt of change at Vx, how many millivolts of change are there at V out? And again, I don't need like the number, just you know, conceptually. I heard somebody say 10 <laughs> or did I just miss here? C up over C up plus CS. Ah, okay. Well what is what do we usually call that? Feedback factor. Yeah, there we go, right? So it's actually one over the feedback factor, right? Because from there to there, that's the gain of f, right? So if I go the other way, it's one over f, OK? So you're exactly right. So if I know how much voltage swing is happening here, then I know that during that slewing period, there's going to be that same voltage swing divided by f, OK? So that's exactly what this thing right here is saying. It's just saying, once I know how much Vx has to travel, just multiply that by 1 over f. That's how much the output voltage has to travel. Okay. Well, once you know that, actually now things are pretty easy. Because if you remember, again, you know, if I have a linear, uh, constant current sucking out of a capacitor, the amount of time it's going to take to move by a certain voltage is just that capacitance times the change in voltage divided by the current. Okay, so the way really to sort of interpret that expression there is that CL effective times delta Vx over F divided by ISS. Okay, and of course that's completely equivalent to what's written there, but just intuitively that's how that happened. Okay? So now actually I claim that's sort of it. Because I now know this is the amount of time that I'm going to be slowing, right? And so now the only thing that's really left is for me to figure out how long does it take me to linearly settle after I get out of that slewing region. And again, I claim that's actually pretty easy. Because once I'm in the linear region, I know that Vx started exactly at V star, right? And so I also know exactly how much basically swing is left on the output. And I can just use my standard you know, single pole, or perhaps even more complicated, but basically my single pole settling to answer how much time it's going to take to do that. And so that's, again, all that's actually happening here. So since I know that eventually this is supposed to go from V star to 0, then basically the amount of swing I have to do at the output is V star over F. And so if I want to know what the linear settling time is, I just take that V star over F. So that's actually, and again, I'll just rewrite this slightly just to make it more clear. So V star over F is the amount of voltage at the output that you start with, right? That you have to basically settle out. And then I just compare that to the final voltage I want to settle to, right? Which, of course, the final voltage I'm supposed to settle to is just the closed loop gain times the input step. In other words, CS over CF times the input step. And again, remember, if I'm talking about settling, I want to settle it to within some accuracy off that step. So that's what that epsilon is. Okay. So again, that's just the expression inside of there. Okay. So this, this whole thing right here, that's just telling you what's the sort of relative settling or you know, how many decades of settling do you need to do. So once you've done that, you just take the natural log of that. That tells you what the settling time is in terms of the tau of the amplifier. So just as a reminder, let's say that this ratio came out to be, I don't know, 10 to the 2. So how many tau of settling would this turn out to be? Uh, is it 2 tau? How many tau is it per decade of settling? 2.3. Yeah, it's 2.3 tau per decade. So just 
exactly. So it'd be 4.6 tau if that was supposed to be 10 to the minus 2. Okay? So it's 10 to the minus 3, it's 6.9, and so on and so forth. Okay? But basically now I'm actually done because I know how much time I slew. I know how much time it's going to take me to linearly settle. I can add those two together. That's my overall settling time. Okay? And by the way, in case this isn't, you know, 100% clear, don't worry, you're going to work it out on the homework. So you're going to get even more closed form expression than what I wrote here. Okay? Any kind of questions on this, or does this sort of make sense? Okay, good. So that's actually basically it in terms of settling. You know, we walk through a whole bunch of different pieces. So what I really want to do now is actually go through an example of how would we go about really doing a given amplifier design. Okay, just kind of walk through an example, essentially design methodology, so that you guys have an idea of how do we sort of synthesize all of the concepts that we've been talking about so far to actually do a real design. Now, again here, even though I keep repeating that, you know, I'm not a believer in you just taking specs and building them, you have to understand how to do that in order to understand how to engineer the specs, okay? So, for this example, I'll really be basically sort of giving you a set of specs, and we'll see how that translates into how you build the amplifier. But of course, to, to, to at least to understand where the specs even came from in the first place, we need to sort of come up with some application that we're going to be interested in. So for this example, I'm going to pretend that I'm interested in building a 50 mega sample per second, 11-bit ADC. Okay? And maybe this amplifier that we're going to be using is right at the front end of that ADC. Okay? So we're, as we're going to see in one second, just by telling you this, already I can actually come up with some pretty good guesses to what all of these different specs are going to have to be. Okay, so let's sort of start out with maybe the quote-unquote simplest one first. So, what kind of accuracy am I going to need? In other words, if I looked at the settling error that I can tolerate, if I wanted to build an 11-bit ADC, what's kind of the biggest settling error that you could tolerate? And of course, I'm talking about relative settling error. Okay, half a bit, that's right. Ah, okay, there we go. So if I had exactly one half of a bit for this settling accuracy, that would have been 1 over 4,000. But remember, there's other errors too, right? So I don't just have settling errors. I have things like thermal noise and you know, maybe other errors in the system. So I probably don't want to give my entire error budget just to that accuracy. So as an example, in this particular case, rather than making it 1 over 4,000, let's make it 1 over 10,000. Just let's say that's how I'm going to partition things out. In other words, I want this accuracy to be 1e e minus 4. Okay? So fairly accurate, and we'll sort of see how that, what implications that's going to have on us. Okay, so now, how much time am I going to have to actually reach that settling accuracy, given that I want a 50 mega sample per second converter? <laughs> How much time is that amplifier going to have to operate? And remember, it's a switch cap amplifier. <clears throat> yeah, 10 nanoseconds, right? Because my entire period, if it's 50 mega samples per second, is 20 nanoseconds. And since I'm doing the switch cap amplifier, I basically have only about half of the clock period to actually operate. In fact, life is even a little bit worse than that because there's actually the switches around the amplifier. They're not instantaneously fast, so they actually have some basically RC delay associated with them. And in fact, as we said, you usually have to do some non-overlap time because you don't want to make you want to make sure the switches never short each other out. But definitely at the most the best you can possibly get is 10 nanoseconds, right? So let's just assume that we have that for now. We can obviously go back and, you know, since the point of this is just to go through the example, you can always go back and rerun with slightly different numbers. Okay, so 10 nanoseconds sounds reasonable to me. Next, we should figure out what's the dynamic range. And what this really means is, what's the sort of signal-to-noise ratio that we want to achieve? 
So to figure that out, anybody remember sort of, and uh, by the way, I'm going to quote this in dB, but we can do it in a linear scale too. Anybody remember how many dB you need for every bit of accuracy or every bit of resolution in the ADC? Yeah, it's 6 dB. So in fact, if you actually looked at like, you know, if somebody tells you they have an n bit ADC, then the dynamic range you need is there's a 1.76 plus 6 times n. Or of course, it's n bits. Okay, so I usually forget about that 1.76 just because it's annoying, and you know, for a large number of bits, it doesn't matter that much. But basically, this would tell you that you'd need at least, you know, if it's 11 bits, that's 66 dB plus 1.76, or 67.76 dB. Okay. Okay. So now, just to be, you know, again, really clear. So if I set the dynamic range to exactly that 66.7 dB. Will I really get an 11-bit converter, or will I get slightly worse than that? What do you guys think? Who thinks you get exactly an 11-bit converter? Don't get exactly an 11-bit converter? OK, good. So what's the problem? Why well, don't I exactly get an 11-bit converter? Yeah, there's other errors still, right? As an example, there was this accuracy error. So again, just as an example here, I'm going to say maybe roughly speaking, I'm going to budget half of my error to the accuracy, and maybe half the error to thermal noise. By the way, I don't claim this is by any means optimal, but I'm just going to do it that way just to kind of drive some example numbers. So rather than doing you know, 67.7 dB, I'm going to do 70 dB of dynamic range. In other words, you know, just to be clear, a signal to noise ratio of 1e7. Okay? And again, that's basically that extra 3 dB was just taking off, like making it so that there's about half of the noise is thermal and half of the errors are from other stuff. Okay? Okay, so now the, this you know, last couple things, I'm just going to tell you I want a closed loop gain of 8 because I've decided that's what I want. Turns out oftentimes you want a large closed loop gain in the first stage just to reduce the noise of all the following stages. So just you know, take it on faith for me that I chose eight. You could again choose something else later, but let's use that for now. So then finally, the only sort of spec we have left is power. So what do you think we want to do with power? Yeah, minimize, right? I'm not going to give you a number. I'm just saying I don't care what it is, but it better be as small as it possibly can. Okay. So if you're running any more than needed, then, then I'll be upset. OK, so now we've got some specs. We can use these to sort of go and drive a design procedure. OK? So I should note, you know, I'm going to sort of walk through this in a kind of step-by-step -step way. But it's by no means the case that this design procedure is like the only way you could do things. And in fact, kind of the point of this class is for you guys to figure out for yourselves what is the right design procedure to use across a range of different analog building blocks you might be interested in. And really across a range of different sort of characteristics that we might be talking about. So again, you should take this as an example, but it'll be useful to you to sort of synthesize all the material we've been talking about so far. OK. So first thing I'm probably going to do, just because you'll see that's actually going to drive a lot of the other calculations that we're going to come up with, is actually to essentially guess the device bias points. OK? And by the way, for when I'm doing this, I'm just going to assume that you know, I kind of looked at it and I want to build a general purpose OTA. So I've decided that I'm going to be building a folded cast code. Okay. So if I have a folded cast code, then I have a sort of a few device biases that I have to pick. And I'll just draw sort of one side of the thing just to make it clear. So I might have the input device. I have the bottom current source over there. I have the cascode. I have another cascode over there. And then, of course, I have the upper current source, and that's my output, right? So basically, the bias points I have to choose are the V star of the input device. I also need to choose the V star 
of basically, and let me call this M in, let me call that MCS, I'll call that MCS2, this is MCS1, sorry. Okay, and then the CAS codes, I'll just call those, you know, underscore CASC, so underscore CASC. Okay, so I have the V star of sort of the upper current source. I, of course, also have the V star of the lower current source that's carrying double the current. And let's just assume that for all the CAS codes, I, I choose the same V star for those kind of across the board. Again, I'm just sort of doing this just to make life a little bit easy. Okay, so that's my sort of choices that I have in terms of the bias points. Let's maybe just walk through really quickly and figure out what are the sort of the considerations that I might have in choosing those different bias points. And as we do that, you know, for each one, I'll just pick one for us. And, but obviously, you guys could do that design procedure yourselves as well. So let's start out, of course, with the input device. What are kind of the considerations that I might have in terms of choosing that V star? What are the things I should sort of keep in mind? What's going to be trading against what? Well, in general, what kind of V-star do you want to use for your input device? Small. Oh, yeah. yeah, you usually want small, right? Why do you want small? Big GM. Okay. Yeah, you want good GM, right? You want to get a good GM over ID. In other words, if you make it small for the same GM, you don't have to burn that much bias current, right? In other words, power is kind of a consideration. So by the way, I'm going to tell you, I've decided I'm going to pick 120 millivolts. Okay, so reasonably small. What else actually kind of comes into the picture there? What else does that the V star of the input device directly affect? Swing. Sorry. Swing. Okay. Um, actually, in the folded cascode, it doesn't have a huge impact on the swing. In general, it might. Uh, anything else? Capacitors. Okay. Uh, wow, we got a bunch of them. Okay, so there was definitely noise in there. We'll see that more in one second. Uh, I think somebody said also FT. That's also definitely true. And by the way, that FT, that really means how big the input cap is, right? OK, so let's say you know, I looked at all these things. I chose 120 millivolts. I've decided that's a good choice. Later on, we'll see how we evaluate if that really was a good choice or not. OK, now let's look at, let's say, the current source. And this one is the PMOS current source that only carries 1x the current. Okay, so what's kind of the consideration that I need to use there? What are the sort of things that are going to trade off with each other? <clears throat> Why might I want to make it big versus make it small? What do you guys think? How do we size current sources in general? Big. Large GM. Uh, well, okay, so do I want large GM in current sources? Large GM, large, large V star. There we go. Okay, so I, I want large V star to get low noise, right? But what's the trade off? Small GM. Uh, well, small GM is actually kind of good because I'm not using it to amplify the signal, right? But what is the trade off that I pay if I use a large V star? Output resistance? Uh, you're kind of going in the right direction. Capacitance? Uh, yeah, no, actually, capacitance is better for a large V star, right? So, what, Paul Han, what'd you say? Yeah, big device. Uh, no, so again, large V star actually means that the device is smaller for a given unit current. So, all the stuff you guys mentioned is actually good. That would push me to have large V stars everywhere. Why don't I like to do that? What's that? <clears throat> what's that? You know, trade-off thing that I kept telling you. It's always you either get low this or large that. So, what's that? Low noise or large? Swing. There we go, swing, right? If you make the V star too big, you have no swing at all, right? So the trade-off here is you want to get low noise, but you also want large swing. Okay, so you have to sort of figure out what's the trade-off between those, what's the right place to set it. So here I'm just going to decide, again, I kind of, this is going to be somewhat arbitrary, but this is going to turn out to be a reasonable choice. I'm deciding I'm going to make that 200 millivolts, okay? And of course, I have a similar trade-off for the bottom current source as well. So here again, somewhat arbitrarily, I'm going to choose that to be 220 millivolts. 
And you'll see why I maybe made that a little bit bigger in one second. Okay, so for both of those, it's basically noise and swing I have to worry about. Okay, so now I just basically have one last thing. That's the V star of the cast codes. Okay, and so here, I'm going to also make this actually pretty small. I'm going to arbitrarily choose 120 millivolts. But again, what's the trade-off there? What are the things that you have to consider when you do that? So why do you want to make that big versus make it small? GM. Okay, why do I care about GM and the cast code? Why is that important? Capacitance. <laughs> okay, well, I care about GM because, it, because there's capacitance there. I agree with that. But, you know, what's the problem if I, for example, had really small V star? What would be the issue I'd run into? Remember all that annoying stuff you did with the game boost cast code? The device would be too big so you get parasitics. Okay, so I, I'll, I'll get parasitics. How could that, you know, what's like the really, really, really nasty way that that could cause problems for me? Uh, your pole goes into your pass band. Yeah, there we go, right? If, if I make this cast code nodes pole at too low of a frequency, the whole amplifier will be unstable, right? So basically, the trade-off that I have here is kind of the FT of the cascode device, which is important for sort of stability or the non-dominant pole. So that would want to make me use a large V star. But why do I want to use a small V star? What's that going to, how's that going to help me if I actually use a smaller V star? Why do I want a small V star? Huh? Swing? Yeah, there we go. Swing, right? Because it's just eating up into my headroom. OK, good. So let's say I chose all these things. Well, what, what I'm kind of getting at is that you can see here already, basically what the real trade-off is is between noise versus swing. So now that I've chosen all these, well, not only, but that's kind of one of the key trade-offs we're going to be dealing with. So now that I've chosen all these bias points, the first thing I'm probably going to want to know is what's the sort of noise factor of my or my NF for this amplifier. And if you guys remember, that was just 1 plus V star for the current source divided by the input device V star plus 2 times the second current source, again, divided by the V star of the input device. Okay? And again, that was just based on knowing that there's IB of current there and 2 IB of current there and, of course, IB of current there. Okay. So if you work out these numbers with my bias points that I chose, that turns out to be 2.1. And so by the way, that's why you know, this factor of 2 here was the reason I chose a slightly higher V star for that second current source. Okay? So I know something about sort of my noise factor in the amplifier. So, and actually, really the next thing I need to do. Is that, is that equation, did you write that down like you meant to write it down? Yeah, that's correct. Oh, no, uh, sorry, that's flipped. You're right. Thank you. You're absolutely right. There we go. Good. You guys are paying attention. At least Brian is paying attention. Okay, so we know the NF, right? So now all we have to do, well, not all, but the next thing that's probably interesting is since we know noise, we also want to calculate the swing. And by the way, I'm doing all this because as soon as we know both of these, we can actually very quickly calculate what the size of the capacitors are, and then we can use that to actually calculate the GMs that we're going to need. Okay? Yeah? So that noise factor is ignoring the cascode devices, right? That's right. I'm ignoring the cascode devices. But remember, as long as I've chosen this to be at a high enough frequency, that's a pretty reasonable assumption. Okay, so you're right, we're basically ignoring it, so maybe you would even want to budget a little bit of extra margin for yourself. But as long as you kind of did a quote unquote good job there, you probably shouldn't be too off. Okay, so now we just need to sort of figure out the swing. So, by the way, this whole thing I'm assuming is in a 0.18 micron process with a VDD of 1.8 volts. Now, there's just one piece of bad news. Anytime anybody gives you a power supply and says, okay, this voltage is blah, 
what they then usually follow it up with is, well, actually, it's blah plus minus 10%. Okay? So from our standpoint, if we're really interested in sort of getting the maximum swing we can really support, we better take into account that actually there could be a 10% lower VDD. In other words, we better actually take this and say, well, really the minimum VDD is something like 1.6 volts. In other words, 10% lower than the nominal. Okay. So now if I want to calculate the swing, I should do that with VDD min. Okay. So what is that swing going to be? What is the maximum swing I can support in that folded CAS code? Just, you know, let's start throwing out some terms. K V star. Okay, let's assume K is one, so that's a good one. But so you know, what's like what what's like the very first term we should start with? VDD. There we go, okay, yeah. So it's VDD min. Okay, now I'm gonna be just starting to lose some stuff. So which V stars do I have to start knocking off? CS1, CS2. There we go. So I lose the V star of the CS1. I lose the V star of the CS2. And what else do I lose? Cast code. Yeah, I lose two times the cast code, right? <coughs> OK, well, so if you work that out, that turns out to be 940 millivolts. OK, so we know the swing now. So it turns out, once we know the swing and the noise factor, next step we can actually take, more, and again, where we're trying to go to is figure out how big the capacitor should be so that we can then actually figure out the bias current and et cetera. Next step we can take is actually calculate what's the maximum input swing we can tolerate. Okay? And the way we know that is basically we know what the output swing is. And of course, we know the closed loop gain. So the maximum input swing <laughs> is just the output swing divided by the closed loop gain, right? OK. And by the way, let me just redraw the amplifier here again to make sure that it's clear. So that's CS, CF. And of course, there's a CL over here. And there's a VN. OK. And of course, there's also a CI. OK. So now, next thing I want to do is Remember, I gave us a certain dynamic range spec. If you guys remember from the homework, in the first phase, you're just going to be sampling noise directly onto CS, right? In other words, you're going to have noise at the input that's just KT over CS. Well, so if I already gave us a certain dynamic range spec, we better make sure that that noise that I sample from the input is basically small enough that I'm not going to mess up my overall dynamic range. So in other words, what I can basically say now is that because I know the maximum input swing, I can calculate CS based on the dynamic range and the input swing. OK? So just to make sure sort of that's clear, so remember that dynamic range is kind of like the SNR. So I'm just going to have something that looks like this, right? OK, so what's the, we just said the noise that I'm going to be sampling is KT over CS, right? OK, what's the input signal power that I actually have? What is that going to be set by? RMS of the input signal? Yeah, it's set by the RMS of the input signal. So what is that? And, you know, just RMS usually has a factor of half in front of it. So now all we have to know is what's the amplitude of the sinusoid? Because, of course, that's what's going to get squared there. Half the swing? Yeah, there we go. It's going to be half the swing, right? It's going to be VI swing divided by 2. Okay, And again, that's just because since I have this single-ended amplifier here, the amplitude is always half of the peak to peak. Okay? Okay, so now if I do that, and remember we said we wanted about 70 dB of dynamic range. Uh, clearly, you can't allocate all of that just to the input network. But you know, for here to make my life easy, let's assume that I did that. So I just set that equal to 1E7. And so if you solve this, you'll find out that CS is just 
24 picofarads. Okay? So now just as a reminder, the closed loop gain was supposed to be 8. So if I know CS, what's CF going to be? Three. Yeah, 3 picofarads, right? Okay, so in fact, I've got both of those already now basically set for me. Okay, so once I've done that, now remember, <coughs> if I want to know how much noise is coming from the amplifier, I have to know not only CS and CF, but basically, I need to know how big I should be making CL and how big that input cap is, right? So the next step I really have to take is actually to guess what the feedback factor is going to be, OK? And by the way, this is really where the trade-off with V in star comes in, right? Because again, if I make that V star too small, then the input cap will be really large. So here, just, you know, as again, kind of a, a guess to make, to allow myself to proceed. Well, let me assume that C in is equal to CF. Okay, just, you know, again, it's assumption, but we'll see later on whether that's valid or not. Okay, so if that's the case, what is the feedback factor going to be? What would it have been ideally? One ninth. Yeah, ideally it would have been one ninth. Because Cn is equal to Cf, now it's one tenth. Okay? So that's my feedback factor. Okay. So now that we've done that, so I know Cs, I know Cf, I know the input cap, I know the feedback factor. So really, what I have to do next is figure out how much load capacitance do I have to explicitly add in in order to meet my dynamic range spec at the output of the amplifier. So next what I'm going to do is calculate CL based on the output dynamic range. Okay. And so again, that dynamic range is just going to be equal to the signal power squared divided by the noise power squared. So now we just have to remind ourselves what those two things are going to be. So OK, so what's the signal power going to be? Almost kind of by definition, by the way, but what's that going to be? Yeah, OK, so the swing is, you know, what's the relationship between the swing and the amplitude? Yeah, exactly. Right? So we're going to have VO swing over 2 here. Okay, and so now all we need to remember is what's the noise coming from the amplifier? Well, just as a reminder, of course, there's going to be a KT over CL effective there. Anybody remember what were the other factors we picked up or that need to be added here? NF. Yeah, so that's times NF, right? Anything else that comes into the picture? That was one of the reasons why we really didn't want a big CI. The feedback factor. Feedback factor, exactly. Right? That's 1 over F there. Because again, remember, right, when I look on that node right there, this whole thing just looks like a 1 over GM, but with that feedback factor. right? And so the smaller that feedback factor is, the larger the impedance from the GM. So the more voltage noise you actually get showing up at the output. Okay. So that's exactly what the dynamic range is at the output. So now if I use that, I know that the effective load capacitance, and again, I'm just plugging in the numbers from what we had done before, turns out to be 7.9 picofarads. Okay? And I remember that CL effective includes some of the loading from the feedback caps. So we're not going to explicitly add that full amount. What we're actually going to do is say, okay, that effective cap is CL plus turns out to be 1 minus F times CS. Oh, sorry, times CF, excuse me. Which, if we just run the numbers, will give us that CL is supposed to be 5.2 picofarads. Okay? 
Okay, so now actually we've, we've made quite a bit of progress. We know all the caps. We know roughly, you know, we know the swings. We've chosen all the bias points. So now really the only thing left for us to do is to basically figure out the GM. And the way we're going to do that is by looking at the settling requirements. Okay, so step number seven here is basically calculate GM based on the settling. And actually, to be even more precise, it's going to, we're going to be calculating also the closed loop, or excuse me, the open loop gain, also based on the settling requirements. Okay? So let's just start out with the GM first. So if you guys remember, I said that my overall error was supposed to be 1e minus 4, right? So here, just to sort of come up with something, let's say, reasonable, I'm going to say that my, oops, this should be static. I'm just going to partition equally between the static and dynamic errors, OK? So now let's say that I, you know, let's just start out with the dynamic side. So the dynamic side, I need an error of basically uh, 0.5 e minus 4. So let's just assume that this thing is a totally linear settling, OK? So how many, basically, if I want to get that 0.5e minus 4, roughly speaking, how many tau of settling do I need? And maybe to make life easier, you know, if I told you that the, the accuracy there was 1e minus 4, how many tau would you say that you needed? 9.2. There we go, 9.2, right? Well, OK, so if you want another factor of 1 half off of that, that's basically one more tau. So it's going to turn out to be 10 tau. OK, and again, just to remind everybody, if you're not sure how that happened, the settling time is just natural log of the error times tau, which is going to be 10 tau. And of course, we're going to set that equal to, if you remember, we had our 50 mega sample per second converter. That's 10 nanoseconds, OK? Well, so what that basically tells us now is that the tau has to be one nanosecond, OK? OK, well, so in terms of our amplifier, what is that tau set by in terms of the caps and the GM and et cetera? What is that tau? Again, this is what the amplifier looks like over here. So what is the time constant if I look back onto that node right there? GM over CL is effective. Ah, OK. Well, so you guys actually gave me the frequency, but you know, one over that is the tau. So it's going to be CL effective divided by GM. Now, am I just missing one minor thing, quote unquote? So what's the minor thing I'm missing? F. Yeah, there we go, times F. OK. Well, so again, I can actually take those numbers. If you work that out, what you'll find out is that the GM you need is 79 milli Siemens. And I didn't actually make any mistakes there. That's really how big it is. OK, so that's a pretty you know, hefty GM. The good news is you know, this is you know, maybe large, but actually you're going to see it's pretty close to what you really would need. All right, so there's things like the CAS code, and there's going to be some other things that we'll mention in a second. You have to double check. But you know, even though this is big, at least it kind of gives us about the right answer. So we can be kind of pretty confident that we're going to be close to right ballpark. So by the way, if you want to know sort of how much bias current this corresponds to, that's of course just GM V in star divided by 2, which turns out to be 4.7 milliamps. Okay. So we know what we need from the standpoint of the GM now. So that's how we use this. So now we can also use this to calculate actually what's the open loop gain that we need. OK, well, so remember, to get a certain static error, that basically means that the DC loop transfer has to be greater than 1 over that static error. And so of course, if we just plug in the number, that means that the open loop DC transfer has to be greater than 2E4. OK? Well, so now if we work that out, that's going to tell us that the open loop gain 
has to be greater than, oh, what did I do here? Oh, right. Basically, that's just the open loop transfer divided by f, right? Because remember, the feedback factor, if I walk through the whole loop, then I go through av0 times f. So if I want to make sure that t0 basically is greater than this, oops, of course, that has to be greater than, I'll just say it that way, right? Where, again, t0 has to be greater than 2e4, right? Okay, so if you work all that out, what you'll find out is that the open loop gain has to be greater than 200,000, okay? Okay, so now that's a big number, right? So that's going to tell us that we have to look actually pretty closely at kind of the design of our amplifier. Right, we better make sure that I really can actually hit that high of a gain to meet the settling accuracy. So now this is kind of, I mean, we could have actually estimated this even a little bit earlier. In fact, we could have done it much earlier. But it turns out this doesn't have a huge impact on the rest of the design procedure, except in that maybe I'm going to be changing the channel lengths a little bit, or maybe if I know that this is really big, that maybe I have to add some gain boosting or something. But if you walk back through, you'll notice that most of the calculations we did so far are somewhat insensitive to exactly what this value is here. Okay, so this is kind of a useful check at this point so that you can go and say, okay, well, is this going to be feasible with the architecture that I chose in the first place? And as an example, you might like build an initial amplifier or you kind of look at the devices and see, okay, can I get close to that kind of swing? If not, maybe I can just tweak, or if I am close, maybe I can just tweak the devices a little bit. But if I'm really way off, maybe I need to go back and sort of reevaluate what architecture I'm using. Okay? But let's assume I can indeed get that amount of open loop gain. So really the next step is actually just to size up the devices. Okay? So to do that, kind of first thing I have to do which is, of course, related to that gain spec, is just pick the channel length. Okay? And again, as usual, sort of the, the trade-off here is we want to basically pick the minimum L that meets our gain. Right? And in particular for the input device, since that guy's capacitance is going to be loading the input, that really pushes you generally towards fairly short channel devices on the input. Maybe you'll use longer channels on like the cast codes or the current sources to kind of boost up the gain. But particularly on the input, you generally want pretty short channel devices. So in this case, let's just assume that I chose an input device of a quarter micron. Again, this is a 0.18 micron process. Okay? So just if you sort of, you know, for my example technology that I'm going to be using, it turns out that if I wanted to calculate the width for that, then it turns out the sort of current density for this device at the V star that I chose is 80 microamps per 10 microns. Okay? So if I just basically run the numbers there, that turns out to be 587.5 microns for that 4.7 milliamps that I mentioned we had earlier. Okay? Nothing magic there. This is just kind of, this is the step where you use the device lookup table. Okay? So now that I actually know the size of the input device, now I can actually sort of go back and check, was I really sort of doing the right thing? Because if you remember, at some point I had to just assume what the C in was. Well, now I actually have a real device. So I can actually check what is C in. Okay? So... Okay, if I just run the numbers, CGS, of course, is two-thirds WL C aux, which for this particular device that I chose, you know, again, I'm just sort of going to plug in some numbers. I'm going to assume that C aux is 10 femtofarads per micron squared. Okay, so if you just run this out, you basically end up with something like 979 femtofarads. Okay? So now, if you remember, I had assumed that CGS, or really C in, was equal to CF, which if you remember was 3 picofarads. Okay? 
In other words, my actual CN is a lot less than CF. And just let me make that clear. Okay? So now, here's the sort of interesting question. Is that good news or bad news? What do you guys think? Who thinks it's good news that my CN is lower than my than CF or lower than what I assumed? Okay, who thinks it's bad news? <laughs> okay, so you think it's both good news and bad news and everybody else has no opinion. Okay, well, so you actually got the right answer, but so because of that, I'm not going to ask you. So now somebody else has to answer. So what's the good news? Why is it good that CN is less than what I assumed it was? What's the benefit I'm going to get from that? Better dynamic range. Yeah, in other words, my noise is actually going to be lower than I thought it was, yeah. right? So that's good news. What's the bad news? That we over-designed. The feedback factor is not as small as you think. Uh, you're right, the feedback factor is not as small, but that's why I actually have lower noise, right? But I think you're actually going in the right direction. You've kind of over-designed it, so right? You're spending more power than you Bingo. Need. You're spending more power than you actually needed to. Because, in fact, maybe if I increase that CN up to that three picofarads, I could reduce my V star, and maybe I could actually spend less power, right? So this is the point where you sort of go back and say, oh, okay, maybe I should tweak this or adjust this one way or the other, right? Now, by the way, actually, just to make sure it's clear, if you remember, I had chosen a VN star of 120 millivolts. How much more room do I really have to move that V star? What's like the smallest I could possibly make that V star? Anybody remember? Probably about 100 millivolts. Uh, it's a little bit less than that. It's about like 7580, right? It depends on exactly the ideality factor of the transistor and subthreshold. But remember, you can't make V star smaller than kind of something related to KT over Q, right? Because when you get into the BJT region, that's it. That's the peak GM over ID. And so that's kind of the smallest V star you can choose, right? So the kind of silver lining here is that if the smallest I could have chosen was about 80 millivolts, OK, even if I completely didn't care about CN, I know that at most I could have only saved maybe a factor of, I don't know, 50% or so in terms of power. Because right? the relationship between 80 millivolts and 120 millivolts, there's not like a huge difference there. Obviously, if I had chosen like 200 millivolts instead of 120, then maybe I would have really said, OK, I should really go back and readjust that fairly significantly, OK? So actually, this is kind of it in terms of the design procedure. But there's really just kind of a couple of things that we need, you know, we can kind of go back and maybe clean up a little bit. So the first just has to do with the settling. So if you remember, when I calculated the settling, I assumed it was a pure single pole, right? But actually, we know we have all kinds of these other things happening, right? If nothing else, we know that we have a feed forward zero, right? That right half plane zero that we spent a lot of time talking about last time. So I better basically check what's going to be the impact of that feed forward zero. In other words, how much additional tau I actually need to move in order to take care of that extra swing that's happening there. Okay, and again, just as a reminder, that's going to come about from something like, you know, if I have this as my amplifier, so that's CL, that's CF, that's CS. Or again, this is 24 picofarads, this is 3 picofarads, and this was, I believe, 5.2 picofarads. Right? When I put the step in right there, I'm also going to get some kind of step at the output right there. Okay? So in general, I better go and check basically if I had that extra swing I had to do, how much is that going to mess up my settling? Now, for this particular example, do you guys think this is going to be a problem or no? Or a big problem, I should say? Do you think this is going to be a big deal or not such a big deal for this example? What sets the height of that step relative to this step? 
Yeah, it's just a cap divider, right? Okay. So, which which cap? You know, given the cap divider I actually drew here, do you think this is going to be a big deal or not such a big deal? <coughs> CS is pretty big, so. Okay, CS is big. I agree with that, but CS actually shows up in series with CF, right? Okay, so how how big is CF in comparison to CL? Big, not too big. Eh, kind of medium, right? Maybe small. But remember, I have a gain of 8 in this thing. So if I actually attenuate the input getting from here to there by even, let's say, about a factor of 2, and then I have another factor of 8 in gain, now we're talking about something that's kind of an order of magnitude smaller, right? So probably for this particular example, not too big of a deal. Probably not something that, I, you know, I mean, I'll maybe lose an extra 0.2 tau or something like that from that. But nothing really that I would worry all that much about. Okay? In general, you certainly have to check. But here, it doesn't seem to be a problem. OK, so just one last kind of quick thing, of course. And we'll maybe pick this up next time as well. You can't just sort of stop there. You might also have some slewing behavior. So I guess I'll maybe sort of leave this as a little bit of a homework. And when we get back, we'll see you know, how quickly you guys can run this. But so what you should do is you should figure out if this is my CS, which again is 24 picofarads. That's my CF, which is 3 picofarads. And my CL over here is 5.2 picofarads. What you have to do is you have to look at there's going to be an input step there with a certain magnitude. So the question you need to ask yourself is, is the step on that VX right there is that going to be larger or smaller than V star? Because if it's larger than V star, you're going to slew. Okay? So I guess your guys' homework is go, you know, take the numbers we ran and tell me, is this amplifier actually going to slew or not? And by the way, you know, just in case you don't like extra homework, it's good for you because you would be doing this on your real design project anyways. So with that, uh, I guess I hope you guys have a good spring break, and I'll see you guys in about a week and a half.